In section 8.4, that's the last of our single population hypothesis test. We've already tested for population proportion, tested for population mean. Now we're going to test for population standard deviation. Like any hypothesis test, one of the things you're going to start out with is some assumptions. There's two assumptions that we're going to have to make here for a hypothesis test about a population standard deviation. So the assumptions that we want to make, assumptions for hypothesis tests, or sigma, would be these. First of all, like a lot of our hypothesis tests, you're going to assume that we the data come from a simple random sample. The data come from a simple random sample. And then this next one is a lot more important than usual. And that is that the data come from a normally distributed population. Okay, now I said this is a little bit more strict than usual. A lot of times, like in our test for a population mean, you know, as long as you have a sufficient sample size or the data is symmetric, that, that could be good enough to still get a good result from your hypothesis test. But for when you're testing claims about a population standard deviation, then this claim or this assumption becomes more critical. So in as much as it's a little bit more critical, let's remind ourselves of how you can actually test for whether or not something's a normal distribution. So kind of a quick reminder on that part for us. So how would you test for a normal uh, distribution? For a normal distribution. What are the things we can do? Yeah, plot a histogram. What are you looking for in a histogram? Yeah, you want a bell shape. What else? What else can we do? Yes, thank you, Anthony. You want a normal quantile plot? And here, what are you looking for? If your data is normally distributed, what's going to happen? Yeah, the points will be close to the line. Points close to the line. They'd be randomly scattered up and down from the line, but more or less they're going to be close to the line. And there's one more that doesn't tell you if something's normal, but it'll tell you if it's not normal. Does anyone remember that? what that last one is? Outliers. At most, one outlier. Now, if it satisfies this, it doesn't mean that it's normal. It just means that it could be normal. You still have to look at it other ways. Yes? Did you also say if the mean and median are the same? Um, well, that's going to be a... Yeah, that kind of has to be true if you have a normal distribution. The mean and median have to be the same. Uh, I'm not sure that's a complete test because the mean and median could be the same as long as you have a symmetric distribution. So uh, normal distribution, you know, it looks like a bell curve. The mean and the median would be the same here. But if I had a distribution that looked, I don't know, like the profile of a bathtub, the mean and median would also be the same here because um, it's it's going to divide up your data, but the on average, you're going to have that as well. So that's not a complete test. I mean, if, if it failed that, then you could say something's not a normal distribution, but it doesn't 
show that it is a normal distribution if the mean and median are the same? So good question. I like it. It made me think a little bit. Um, now, that said, we're not really going to be on the position to test these and all these types of problems. In fact, the problems I have today, um, we're just going to be given the data uh, or the summary statistics, not the actual data. So we won't be able to dig deep into that and test it. But we will go through the regular generic procedure here and try and test some claims about hypothesis for population standard deviation. Let's look at the first one. <clears throat> and I can see this happening in this town. The piston diameter of a certain hand pump is 0.7 of an inch. The manager determines that the diameters are normally distributed with a mean of 0.7 inch and a standard deviation of 0 0.003 inches. That's really, really small. After recalibrating the machine, the manager randomly selects 23 pistons and determines that the samples so determines that the standard deviation is now 0 0.0022 inches. Is there significant evidence for the manager to conclude that the standard deviation has decreased at the 10% significance level? Okay, well, let's start out with this bunch that I kind of highlighted here in yellow. And that's, it's really getting at the original claim. Has the standard deviation decreased? The standard deviation was three one thousandths of an inch. Has it decreased? So that's really going to get at our original claim. And let's write that down. We're going to want to write that down so that we can refer to that later on. In symbols, what would our original claim be? Standard deviation is less than three one thousandths of an inch. Yeah. Standard deviation is less than three one thousandths of an inch. Nice. Uh, Michal, does, does that go as, is that part of the null alternative, null hypothesis or alternative hypothesis? What do you think? The null hypothesis or the, or the alternative? Chloe, is he right? Yeah. Yes, well done. So in order to be part of the null hypothesis, what would I have to have? The possibility of equality. Now, if you're, if you're not here, then you have to be here. You're one or the other. What's the opposite of this? Greater than or equal to. Greater than or equal to. Now, unfortunately, this won't be one of your choices when you pull down these menus. It'll most likely be that's your choice, the equal to part. I don't think they put the greater than or equal to stuff, but that's okay. Um, so let's, let's work through this hypothesis test then and see where we go, see what we come up with. Mm -hmm. So let's see, this will be example A. We've got an original claim of sigma is less than 0 0.003. That's part of our alternative hypothesis. Did anyone catch the significance level? Yeah, alpha is kind of on the big side, 10%. When you look at peer-reviewed journals and articles, you'll never see 10%. It's going to be 5% or 1%. 10% sounds really big to me, but it's just an exercise in a, in a stat book, so it's not a big deal. What you want to keep in mind is what are the consequences of a type 1 error? What are the consequences of, of getting this wrong? Well, and that's going to govern your choice of this. So the third step is to input some summary statistics. Let's actually get the relevant numbers that we're going to need here. So it says after recalibrating the machine, he selects 23 pistons. So that's N equals 23. And determines that the standard deviation is 
0.0022 inches. So that's our standard deviation. But what notation should I use for this? S. S. Why S and not sigma? I mean, sigma, I mean, the says standard deviation. Why not sigma? Sample. Yeah, it, That's it's coming from your sample, right? So you got 23 observations. It has a sample standard deviation of 0 0.022, 0 0.0022. All right, so let's input that into StatDisk. Of course, we got to figure out exactly where to go. There's StatDisk. Where do you think I should go? I mean, if you're doing this for the first time, what would be a good bet as to, gee, I could probably find what I want here. So analysis, hypothesis testing, standard deviation, one or two samples. One sample. Chapter 8 is all about one samples. In Chapter 9, we'll start testing things with two samples. Very easy thing to forget when testing these things is to check your assumptions and then you also have to change the alternative hypothesis to suit your particular problem. You've got three possibilities here. One, two, or three. Not equal to, greater than, or less than. One, two, or three. Which one do I want? Jaron? Which of these alternatives do I want? One, two, or three? Got to vote for three. Ben, do you agree? Yeah. We want to know when our population standard deviation is less than the claimed standard deviation of 0 0.003. So we're good there. Significance level is a very hefty 0 0.10. Claimed standard deviation is 0 0.003. Sample size was 23. And the sample standard deviation was 0 0.0022. Now we, we can kind of get away with a couple things here uh, because the, proper, the problem says that the manager determined that the diameters are normally distributed. So we're okay there. The simple random sample stuff, we're not going to be able to control that. So I'm not going to harp on you on that one, but those are assumptions we need to do, we need to check. Let's click evaluate. Bam. So what am I looking for from this from this output here? All right, our test statistic and our p value. And in particular for us in this class, we're going to want to know what the p-value is. What's the p-value in this case? Nice. 0 0.3923. So looking good there. Let's move over to the fifth step. The fifth step is where we got to decide to reject or fail to reject. Clara, what do you think? Are we going to reject or fail to reject? So keep in mind your p-value is 0 0.03923. What do you think? Are you going to reject or fail to reject? Is it reject? I got to vote for reject. Philo, do you agree? Yeah. Yeah. And why is that? Nice. On your last test, when I asked you if you're going to accept or reject, all I was looking for is P is less than alpha for justification. If P is less than alpha, if P is low, H naught must go. So in this case, we're going to reject here. Finally, we want to state our conclusion in words. And stating your conclusion in words is why a lot of times I'll write this and circle it off to the side by itself. Is because we're going to need that. We state our conclusion in words. The first thing it asks you is, does the original claim contain the condition of equality? 
Keisha, what do you think? No. Does the original claim contain the conditional equality? No. No, it doesn't. So we branch down here. Do we reject the original claim? Do we reject H naught, I should say? Yes. Yes. So you branch over here. And the way you phrase your conclusion is the sample data support the claim that, and then state your original claim in words. You can go back to the original problem for that. Standard deviation is decrease from 0 0.003 inches. So, or you can just say the standard deviation is less than 0 0.003 inches. <clears throat> So the sample data support the claim that the standard deviation is less than Zero point zero zero three inches. Oops, I'm sorry, I didn't realize I had my screen on the wrong spot. So this, the sample data support the claim that the standard deviation is less than three one thousandth of an inch. Sweet. So is the test statistic 11.83? Uh, so the test statistic, yeah, it is 11.83. Let me remark about the test statistic a little bit um, and, and talk about what's called the classical approach to statistics. So it's just a different way to run your hypothesis test. So back here, I said, you know, one thing you do is input your data. Um, the classical approach would say you would set up a critical region for your test. And the way the critical region looks is going to be based on the distribution of your test statistic. So what is our test statistic? Our test statistic in this one was a chi-square. So if you look at your plot, you'll see the chi-square critical value and the chi-square test statistic. So the chi-square critical value is 14.04. So let me write, let me draw the chi-square distribution. Um, chi-square distribution starts at zero. You don't have to copy this down, but I, I would appreciate if you had a, a decent understanding of what's gonna go on here. Here's a chi-square distribution. What do you suppose the degrees of freedom are going to be? Yeah, n minus 1, in this case, 22 degrees of freedom. Your level of alpha is going to determine the critical region. Is this going to be a left tail, right tail, or two tail test? Left tail. So in order to get convincing evidence that this is false, you'd want a test statistic that's far in the left tail, far enough that you start to doubt whether this could be true. Now, that doubting level starts at 10% for this problem, which is a little bit high. Usually you should do 5%. Well, let's just draw a little line in the sand here. And the classical approach would say, all right, Let's find the spot where, in our case, 10% of the area is right here. So my level of doubt is going to start at 10%, so 0 0.10. And what is that? Well, you have to determine that from the chi-square distribution. Fortunately and conveniently for us, that value is given to us is 14.04. And what happens is if, if your test statistic, what you calculate based on the data that you gather, 
if it falls in here, that's the reject region. Reject H naught. And then fail to reject H naught is going to be here. You have to calculate your test statistic based on the data. I think for this, this particular hypothesis, the test statistic looks something like this. N minus 1 times S squared divided by sigma squared. I think that's your test statistic. In our particular case, it turned out to be like 11 something. <clears throat> so yeah, 11.83. So we got 11, 11.83. What's that saying to do relative to our hypothesis? Reject or fail to reject? Reject. It fell in the critical region, or fell in the rejection region as determined by this critical value. So you're getting the same conclusion that you would if you did it with the classical approach. Now, this is yeah, a fair amount more work, I think. I think it's just as convenient and easy to base things off of a p-value. p is less than alpha, reject. Very simple, very clean. You don't have to refer to a distribution at all. Let me pause for a second. Are we okay with this here? I mean, the classical approach, I do want to say a little bit more about this here for a moment, but this is where you should be putting most of your efforts here. Are we okay with this part? All right, so unanimous yes. Thank you so much. Um, let me ask you a question then. Suppose that I said, you know, 10% is pretty high. People just don't use 10%. I want to make this 5%. Is that going to change my conclusion at all? You two disagree. One said no, one said yes. Because then it would be higher, alpha would be higher than P. Why? Well, or another way around is P is, is less than alpha, right? Oh, okay, never mind. Okay, so <laughs> an amended decision. All right. So it wouldn't change, if P was 5%, it wouldn't change our conclusion at all, would it? No. So... If I, if I go back here and if I say, you know what, that's pretty high and I do this as 0.05 and I click evaluate, um, the p-value is still the same, right? But what's changed is the critical value. So the point with 5% of the area in the left tail, that's moved over. And basically the p-value is the smallest value of alpha for which you could reject. That's really what the p-value is the smallest value of alpha for which you could reject the null hypothesis. So, what if I made alpha 0.01? Would that change my decision? Yeah. That would change your decision because then P would be bigger than alpha and you would fail to reject. I think that's on your handout here. So, let's put in a few things here. Um, that's 11.83. That's your test statistic. The p-value was 0 0.03923. I don't always need all those digits. I just put it there for some reason. And then the last part asks you what I just asked you just now. And that is, if alpha is 1%, then what? Well, then you get this little drop-down menu, and my guess is it would have to say something like this. Uh, since the p-value is not less than the level of significance, fail to reject, the null hypothesis. What do you think on this last one? There is or there is not sufficient evidence to conclude 
the standard deviation um, has decreased at the 0.01 level. Yeah. Yeah, there is not. That's at the 1% level. That's different than our conclusions at the 5 and 10% level. That's okay. They change things up a little bit. And I guess for sake of completeness, there's a little X or something here that appeared. You can just scratch that out. All right. That completes part A, example A. Any wrap up on that? Yes? Can I see the chi squared distribution one more time? I'm just going to imagine it's pretty bottom. Yeah. It's part. Mm hmm. Anything else? Anything else? Okay, let's keep going with part B, or example B. Yeah, you're welcome. And let's take a look at it here. A simple random sample. That's kind of nice to see, because that's one of our assumptions here. Simple random sample of 35 men from a normally distributed population results in a standard deviation of 12 beats per minute. So they're talking about heart rate. The normal range of pulse rates of adults is typically given as 60 to 100 beats per minute. If the range rule of thumb is applied to the normal range, the result, of the standard, result is a standard deviation of 10 beats per minute. Use the sample results with a 10% significance level to test the claim that the pulse rates of men have a standard deviation equal to 10 beats per minute. All right, so there's a lot going on here, but let's start with the claim here. The pulse rates of men have a standard deviation equal to 10 beats per minute. Let's write that down as our original claim in symbols. Cameron, let me ask you to tell me what I should write here. What would that be? Mm. Elijah, maybe some help? Um. Mm. Imran, maybe some help? Uh, standard deviation equals 10. So what symbol should I write here? Chloe? Uh, sigma? Yeah, sigma. And thank you both. All right. Uh, sigma equals 10. Good. Uh, Johnny, what's that lead me with for my null and alternative hypothesis? Uh, null would be sigma equals 10. Good. Alternative would be um, does not equal Perfect. Sigma equals 10. Sigma is not equal 10. And let's see. What's our level of significance for this one? 10%. Yeah, I just, I'm just bothered by that, but you know, I guess I'll have to get over it. 10%. Now, there's probably some data that we're going to need to input into this. Let me explain a little bit about where they're coming up with that um, uh, the 10 here. The 10 is coming from the, what's called the, the range rule of thumb. And that goes back to something we learned about the normal distribution. So when we had the normal distribution, the center line was mean, the mean. And then we said, all right, well, we can go out one standard deviation from the mean and get something like this. Um, let me fill in these areas. How much of the data was within one standard deviation from the mean? Does anyone remember? 68%. 
and 68%. That's how much was in within one standard deviation from the mean. And then we can go out a little bit further. We can go out to two standard deviations away from the mean. So mu minus two sigma to mu plus two sigma. And how much data was supposed to be in this range? 90, how much? 95%. Well done. So 95%. I have a quick question for you. Yeah, go ahead. Um, when the hypothesis is equal, does that always mean it's going to be two-tailed? Yes. Mm -hmm. Yes. Now, keep in mind that the book sometimes says uh, equal to when we'll say less than or equal to or greater than or equal to. So if that's the case, then you're going to have a one-tail. But if it's generally equal to, then you are going to have a two-tail test. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. So there's 95% of your data is going to be within two standard deviations of the way they mean for normally distributed data. Well, that's close enough to all of your data that we can look at how far of a gap there is between these two. So if you look at the difference between those two, then the top one is mu plus two sigma, the bottom one is mu minus two sigma. That's a distance of four sigma from top to bottom. Top to bottom. So if I took a look at the range, the range, and divided that by four, that's going to give me an approximation to sigma. So it's going to be top minus bottom divided by four is approximately sigma. In this example, it's 100 minus 60 divided by 4. That's where they're getting the 10. But it's approximately 10 based on just the data. This is your range rule of thumb. This is not something that I'm really going to test you on, but if you see it in the homework, at least you'll have seen it. All you got to do is take the top minus the bottom divided by 4, and that's your approximate standard deviation. And, you know, the, how good this is is going to depend on the particular circumstances. But that's where the problem got the number of 10, in case you're curious. Let's look back then and try and put in some numbers for this problem. And let's see. Or collect some numbers. We're looking at the data itself. N equals 35. And then we get a standard deviation of 12.2 beats per minute. What notation should I use here for that standard deviation? Should I use S? Good. I was going to say S or sigma, but you beat me to it, so good on you. S is your standard deviation. I think we're in good shape. We've already checked our assumptions. They gave that to you right at the very first part of the problem. So let's go to stat disk. Which of these three alternative hypotheses should I choose, Abby? Well done, first one. Significance level is back up to 10%. Thank you, Abby. Claim standard deviation. The claim standard deviation comes from the null hypothesis. So Adel, what number should I put in here, please? 10, yes, 10, well done. So 10 there. What was our sample size? 35. And the sample standard deviation was 
Let's see how we did. Nate, what information am I looking for from this screen? We'll test statistic and p-value. All right. And what's the p-value for us? 0.06663. Nice. All right. So our test stat uh, was 50.606. Five or six oh six. Now, mostly our, our decisions are going to be based on the p value. So, what's the p value saying about our null hypothesis? Greg, what do you think? What's the p value saying there? Some help, Derek? What do you think? What's the p-value saying here for us? Reject H naught or fail to reject H naught? It's going to fail to reject. No, it's going to reject because it's yeah. less than. P is less than alpha, so reject H naught. Yes. Excellent. If P is low, H naught must go. And it does. So finally, we need to state our conclusion in words. It's here that it's handy to have, you know, someplace kind of written by itself what that original claim is. Let's look at our possibilities. Does the original claim contain the condition of equality? Yes. yes. Do we reject? Yes. Yes. There is sufficient evidence to warrant rejection of the claim that standard deviation is equal to 10. All right, so let's take a look here. Um, I don't want to use the uh, exact symbols here. There is sufficient evidence. I probably think I should say sample evidence. Sample evidence. Sufficient evidence to warrant rejection of the claim. of the claim. And if you're feeling uninspired about, well, how do I word this? There's nothing wrong with looking back at the original problem and seeing what that original claim is. And here it is, that the pulse rates of men have a standard deviation equal to 12 beat, or to 10 beats per minute. Beautiful. Just put that in there verbatim. That the standard deviation of the pulse rates of men is equal to 10 beats per minute. Uh, and I apologize, I wasn't on the right screen there. Beautiful. Knock that one off. Anything to wrap this one up? For example, B here. All right. I think we're doing pretty good on these things. So I'm going to skip example C and go to example D. Just to give me an excuse to talk to you about something which is, a, is a, literally a real-life application of standard deviation. And that would be in investing. And my suggestion with that is that when you first get your job out of college, you worked long and hard, you get that nice paying job out of college, start investing for your retirement right away. And I can show you the math behind it, but this is a stat class. So let me bring it back to statistics. When you invest money, a lot of times you invest it in things called mutual funds. Mutual funds are just groups of stocks that you can invest in. And the risk associated with that investment is going to be proportional to the standard deviation of their earnings. So to determine the, 
the risk of a mutual fund, you're going to look at its earnings month to month and see how those earnings change. If the standard deviation is less than 3%, then okay, great. Then it means it's a moderate risk. If it's higher, then you can be you know, a riskier investment. It, it depends on what you want. Higher risk means potentially higher returns. Lower risk, lower returns in general. But that risk is measured by your standard deviation. So let's work our way through example D. Suppose your mutual fund qualifies as having moderate risk if the standard deviation of its monthly rate of return is less than 3%. A mutual fund rating agency randomly selects 23 months and determines that the rate of return of a, for a certain fund. The standard deviation of the rate of return is computed to be 2.68%. Is there sufficient evidence to conclude that the fund has moderate risk at the alpha equals 10% significance level? The normal probability plot indicates that the monthly rate of returns are normally distributed. Okay, so they're giving you what you need, which is that assumption of normality. Let's see if we can't parse out some of the rest of this stuff. Let's start with the original claim. Uh, is there sufficient evidence to conclude that the fund has moderate risk? So what has to be true if it has moderate risk? Yeah, the standard deviation is less than 3%. So we'll start with that. That's our original claim. Standard deviation is less than 3%. Now I'm going to write that 3% as a decimal, not as a percentage. From here, you can determine our first step, HO and HA. What are those going to be? Victoria? Um, HA will be the original claim, and H null will be uh, sigma is greater than or equal to 0.3 or 0.03. Perfect. So start by putting this in the alternative hypothesis because it doesn't have the condition of equality. Then this is going to be the opposite of that. You're not going to see this choice, though, when you pull down these menus. What will you see instead? Yeah, they're just going to do the equal. So somebody was asking earlier about, you know, whether or not something is always a two-tail test. The tail is going to depend on what's in the alternative hypothesis. But if your null hypothesis is genuinely sigma equals this versus sigma is not equal to this, then that's going to lead to a two-tailed alternative. Alpha for this is 0.10. Again. Let's copy down some relevant numbers here for us. For instance, the sample size. What's our sample size? 23 months. 23 months, so that's n is 23. And the sample standard deviation for those 23 months was 2.688%. But if I type that in right now, I'd definitely be making a mistake. Yeah, you've got to turn that into a decimal. So move the decimal point two places to the left. And that's going to be your sample standard deviation. Let's put that in and get a p-value, and then finish this up. Ethan, which of these three alternatives do I want for this particular test? One, two, or three? If it's less than, it'd be number uh, three. Yes, excellent. For a less than, it's number three. Our significance level looks good. Claimed standard deviation. Uh, one more time. 0 0.03. 0 0.03, perfect. 0 0.03. Sample size was 23. What was our sample standard deviation? 0 0.0268. 0 
Bam. Okay. Uh, bonus. What what information am I looking for from this output? The uh, would be the, the p-value in the test. All right. Good. So the p-value in this case is zero point two six eight zero nine. Thank you. Uh, what's that saying about our null hypothesis? What's our decision there? Fail to reject. Fail to reject. If P is greater than alpha, you're going to fail to reject. Last but not least, we need to determine how we're going to word our conclusion. So let's take a look at our, our sheet again and take a moment to remind ourselves that the original claim is zero point, or sigma is less than 0 0.3. And let's see. I want you to decide which one of these, one, two, three, or four, A, B, C, or D, which one of them looks good. D. All right, some quick decisions on that one. Um, let me hear from some of my Zoomers. Throw in, throw in a little number in the chat. One, two, three, or four as to which one you think. Mm, not seeing anything coming through yet. Oh, wait, here it's hidden. There we go. All right, so good job. Unanimous amongst the last one. Let's just take a look here and double check. The original claim does not contain the possibility of equality. Did we reject? No, we failed to reject, so we're down here. Um, there is not sufficient There is not sufficient sample evidence to support the claim that by the way you don't get any credit for this part because you're just copying it down from a sheet but what claim did we fail to support well, I, I guess I would accept one of two things. If you wanted to say that the standard deviation is less than 3%, that's fine. Or you could also say equivalently that the fund is of moderate risk, meaning its standard deviation is below 3%, which is the same as this. So let's just go with the simpler, I mean, the kind of straightforward approach was that the standard deviation deviation of monthly rate of returns is less than 3%. Or you could write 0.03, it doesn't matter to me. One thing I avoided was using any symbols or referring to null or alternative hypothesis. Please avoid those in this conclusion. I want this to be in more simple language than that. How are we looking on hypothesis testing for standard deviation? Doing a good question? Would, um, would this work as an answer for the sixth point, there is not sufficient sample evidence to support the claim. Standard deviation is monthly rate of return for mutual funds. Like, as long as I get the 3% of the standard deviation, yeah. like what we're talking about, like the monthly rate of return. Is it yeah, no, that sounded fine. Yeah. Um, I'm not sure if, if I heard is 3% or is less than 3%. There should be a less than there. Yeah. Yeah, that that would be fine. And I appreciate you, you checking that. Creative, do you have a question as well? No? Anyone else? 
Doing good. Going once, twice, three times. Sold to the A student. All right. Good luck with this.